A very good afternoon to you all. On behalf of the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, I welcome you all to this webinar 4 on management of COVID-19. Before we proceed any further, I would take you to Professor J.S. Thakur, who is the chairman of PGI Committee on COVID-19 Prevention and IEC for a short message. So very good afternoon to all of you on behalf of the PGI Committee on Prevention and uh, Education. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the webinar series and today is the fourth uh, webinar which we have scheduled on management of COVID-19. We have a very eminent panel of uh, speakers, Professor Ashish Bala from Department of Internal Medicine who is uh, in the front line from the Department of Internal Medicine uh, dealing directly with the patients. And we have Professor G.D. Puri who is Professor and Head uh, of uh, Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine and also happened to be the Dean Academic of the PGI. And we have Professor Nusrat who is the Professor of uh, Pharmacology and she will be speaking on chemoprophylaxis and uh, drug consideration. So I'm sure that uh, you will enjoy the panel of uh, uh, eminent uh, speakers and uh, their discussion on the topic. And uh, now I hand over to Dr. Arpit to invite the first speaker for this webinar. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Thakur, uh, for this brief introduction to today's mm -hmm. webinar. Uh, today's webinar is a must-attend event and uh, we start with the first speaker of the day, Professor Ashish Bhalla, who is a professor in internal medicine at PGI and he would be talking about management of septic shock and severe acute, uh, acute respiratory infection in COVID-19. All over to Professor Bhalla. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thakur and uh, we're back again for the next uh, session of the webinar on management of COVID-19 and the task which has been assigned to me is to talk about the uh, management of uh, severe acute respiratory illness and to talk about the management of sepsis. Now uh, we all know that fever, dry cough and flu-like symptoms are the common symptoms but the severe symptoms which we have to be always careful about or, or we have to be on the lookout for dyspnea, chest pain, hemopsis, and respiratory insufficiency. Now, uh, this is one slide which we I, I thought I would share with you. Why are we scared? If you look at the symptoms of flu and COVID, find that everything is almost similar. Uh, but the complications in flu are less likely because of the uh, we've been facing uh, influenza virus for a very long time and there is immunity building over a period of time. Uh, however, uh, with COVID-19, there is uh, severe respiratory complications which are more likely because we do not have the requisite immunity. Another thing, why are we scared? Because for flu, there is a flu shot and there is some treatment uh, of doubtful efficacy in the form of oseltamivir, but for COVID-19, uh, although there are very many uh, drugs in pipeline, but we don't have anything more than self-isolation uh, and just uh, preventive strategies which are working. This we had discussed earlier that uh, Ministry of Health divides the COVID positive patients or suspects into mild, moderate and severe. If you have influenza-like illness, fever with upper respiratory tract symptoms like cough, coryza, uh, then you have a mild illness. If you have pneumonia with a respiratory rate of more than 30 and an oxygen saturation of less than 90% or you have hypotension and ARDS, then it is severe. Anything in between these two is moderate disease. Uh, it's important to emphasize again, uh, who is the close contact? Now, whenever you have a positive uh, COVID patient, any healthcare uh, worker who is providing direct care to 
COVID patient is a close contact. Anyone who's working with these healthcare workers who are providing uh, contact, uh, care to positive patient is also a close contact. And anyone who's visiting or staying in the same close environment of a positive COVID patient is a close contact. If you've been working together, you become a close contact. If you've been traveling together with a COVID patient in any kind of conven uh, conveyance, you are a close contact. If you're living in the same household, or if there is an epidemiological link that someone you met uh, for a significant period of time for a 14 day period without taking any uh, personal precaution or maintaining a safe distance from them, then you become a close contact. Now, this again is very clear. When you have a suspect case, you should not keep them together with a positive case. Uh, healthcare center for COVID suspects and positive should be a standalone building. And if it is not possible, then a block needs to be isolated. Where you keep the positive patient, it has to be a dedicated ward, ideally having separate rooms or and a dedicated beds for sick patients like we have in PGI. And all these staff, that is doctors, nurses, but more important than even doctors, nurses, is uh, uh, the people who are taking care of the waste disposal and also the hospital attendants they need to be trained. Uh, an uncomplicated illness is uh, patients who have only fever, cough, sore throat, nasal congestion, uh, headache, muscle pain, or malaise. But an elderly or an immunosuppressed patient may present with atypical symptom. They just, just uh, may present with shortness of breath. Some of them have uh, known to present with altered sensorium only, hypoxia, uh, uh, only uh, headache, severe myalgias. So in elderly and immunosuppressed patients, you should be always more careful. Uh, this is a chest X-ray, which if you look carefully, would ha has some infiltrates on the right uh, lower zone. Uh, patients who have cough with difficulty in breathing and there are no signs of severe pneumonia, you will ca uh, call them mild pneumonia and they are classified as moderately sick COVID patients. Severe pneumonia, any adult or an adolescent who presents with upper respira uh, with respiratory infection with a rate of more than 30, severe respiratory distress and oxygen saturation of less than 90%. Although I've shown the X-ray and the, uh, uh, the CT scan here, but let me caution you here, that a CT scan is not a must for making a diagnosis of coronavirus infection. You can isolate the virus from nasopharyngeal or the throat swab and a chest X-ray can give you along with clinical clues in the form of oxygen saturation, give you enough clues to make a diagnosis of severe pneumonia and you do not, do not need to do a CT scan in every patient. Uh, in children, it is a little uh, uh, kind of different. You may have central cyanosis or a saturation of less than 90%, uh, severe grunting or chest in drawing, uh, inability to breastfeed, drink, there is lethargy, coma or convulsion. Uh, and in case the respiratory rate, which has been kind of uh, depicted here, uh, if it is very fast respiration and all the other signs, you think that these patients would have severe pneumonia. ARDS is new onset, ARDS classically defined new onset or worsening respiratory symptom within a week of known uh, clinical insult and you can have a uh, uh, clinical uh, parameter of oxygen saturation or you can also use FiO2, SpO2 uh, with, uh, 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 with the oxygen saturation and uh, uh, FiO2 ratio, which you can use for diagnosing an acute respiratory distress syndrome. CT scan should again only be done if it is needed, not a must. These are various kinds of X-ray pictures which you can see, starting from the first one on the left upper, uh, on your uh, right upper corner, which is a mild uh, disease, possibly mild <clears throat> infiltrates in left lower zone and some infiltrates on the right lower zone. And then you have the 
progressively increasing shadows in the chest which can uh, depict uh, severity of the illness. Uh, some CT scan features which show diffuse ground glassing uh, most of the lobes so that can also be uh, kind of helpful in making a diagnosis of severe uh, severe uh, COVID pneumonia or can help you in diagnosing ARDS. Now this is what I was telling you if you have a clinical picture you have an x-ray and if you just uh, measure the PaO2 FiO2 ratio if it is less than 300 uh, millimeters Hg you will classify it as mild ARDS if it is less than uh, less than 200 it is moderate and if it is less than 100 with PEEP of more than 5 or in a non-ventilated patient uh, uh, you know you will classify as severe ARDS. Now a question which is commonly asked is that in places where you do not have a facility to uh, get an ABG how do you make the diagnosis of ARDS there you can use an SpO2 that is a, a saturation oxygen saturation by a finger probe uh, and a FiO2 ratio of less than 315 that will suggest an ARDS in non-ventilated patients. How do we manage these patients? Where do we manage these patients? These are Ministry of Health guidelines which uh, okay I've gone further. Can I go back? Back? Yes, sir. Okay, this is this is what I was uh, trying to tell you that there are three different kinds of uh, facilities which have been recognized COVID care center, dedicated COVID health centers and dedicated COVID hospitals. Mild cases should go to COVID care centers which could be hostels, stadiums, hotels or lodges in case the number increases or it can be a dedicated ward in a COVID care facility. Uh, COVID health center is the place where you uh, manage the moderately sick uh, uh, coronavirus infected patients and a dedicated COVID hospital with ICU facility which has oxygenation available for every bed 24 7 that is the place where you will keep the severely ill patients. We all know about these infection control measures which have to be uh, which has to be taken care of in all the patients at all the time medical masks direct patients to separate areas at least one meter difference uh, cover your nose and uh, mouth and contact precautions uh, by performing hand hygiene. The droplet precautions uh, you can if you have a medical mask if you are working within one to two meters of the patient along with uh, eye protection that takes care of most of the things but in case you have you are uh, you know going to perform an aerosol generating procedure uh, there is a high uh, viral load suspected in any immunocompromised individual it is better to use an N95 mask along with eye protection and a full personal protective gear uh, to, to uh, take care of these patients. Early supportive therapy in the form of oxygenation starting at the uh, at the rate of 5 liters per minute and you can always titrate flow to maintain a saturation of more than 90 percent in non-pregnant adults and in pregnant patients you have to be even more vigilant maintain it between 90 to 95 percent. If the child comes with an emergency sign or there is a respiratory distress central cyanosis during the resuscitation the child should receive oxygen therapy and the target is to maintain SpO2 of above 94 percent otherwise uh, the target remains the same as in adults not 90 percent. Uh, what is very very important is that you have to be conservative with fluid management. It has been seen that if you give aggressive fluid resuscitation in patients with coronavirus infection you may worsen the oxygen saturation so you have to go a little slow in fluid management. Uh, early supportive therapy is in the form of early empiric antimicrobial therapy in all patients with severe acute respiratory illness. I must say here that moderately ill patients 
of coronavirus would classify as severe acute respiratory illness or anyone who has infiltrates in lung anyone who has some respiratory symptoms uh, more than the upper respiratory infection would classify as severe acute respiratory illness as a policy in pgi we treat any community acquired pneumonia with third generation cephalosporin and azithromycin or equivalent the same thing can be started in all patients with severe acute respiratory illness and it have to be started within one hour and uh, uh, these are uh, these can be again uh, guided by where the patient has come from if it is community then ceftriaxone azithromycin is good enough if it is a healthcare associated pneumonia or if you have a local epidemiology or susceptibility data you can modify your empiric antibiotic therapy according to that uh, why do we need to increase a neuraminidase inhibitor for treatment of influenza in severe acute respiratory illness uh, illness up front because even today even today we are not done with uh, seasonal flu or h1n1 we are still getting occasional cases of h1n1 and influenza a when we are checking along uh, checking for them along with a uh, uh, covid uh, infection and they can also similarly cause an ARDS uh, as severe ARDS as coronavirus can. Uh, closely monitor all the patients with severe acute respiratory illness that is a moderate uh, coronavirus illness for signs of clinical deterioration, rapidly progressive respiratory failure and development of sepsis. Understand the patient's comorbid condition. Uh, determine whether any chronic therapy the patient is on needs to be stopped or need to be continued always communicate early with the patient and the family they should be they should be understanding what are the risk factors in this patient and they should know the problem in coronavirus uh, infected patients is that most of the family members if the patient is with you in the hospital are quarantined so it will be very difficult to communicate with them but you should at least try to communicate with them telephonically and tell them the update about what is happening with the patient. The specimens need to be collected uh, in a proper manner. I will not go into the details of this. Uh, the initial treatment uh, can be started with face mask with the reservoir bag and you can increase the rate to up to 10 to 15 liters per minute. You can also use high flow nasal oxygen. My, the subsequent speaker would talk more about high flow nasal ox oxygen. There is some role of hyperbaric oxygen. Some of the people have tried it, but uh, uh, as an experimental basis, uh, there is no definitive data on use of hyperbaric oxygen in patients with respiratory failure or ARTS. These are uh, the various kinds of mask you have partial rebreathing mask or non rebreathing mask and then you have the various kind of venturi systems which can be uh, the rate can be adjusted flow rate of oxygen can be adjusted to give uh, to deliver a, a significant fixed amount of oxygen concentration uh, ranging from 21 to up to 40 percent High flow nasal cannula is something which is very important and I think my subsequent speaker is going to talk about it. It has revolutionized the treatment especially in patients with coronavirus infection. Uh, a word about intubation in these patients. Uh, the idea is to delay the intubation as far as possible. What has been seen is that people who have been intubated earlier uh, fared worse than the ones who in which the uh, recruitment money uh, maneuver and high flow nasal cannula is used uh, uh, there they, they have done better uh, compared to the people who've been intubated this is something which is again an important thing uh, in icus proning was routinely being uh, performed but in uh, patients with hypoxemia respiratory failure uh, you know this is something which can be tried awake proning it recruits more alveoli and improves the oxygenation so you can you can 
consider proning for up to uh, 12 hours in a day even in an awake patient. This is an algorithm which talks about uh, if you do not have a target saturation of more than 88 uh, percent with a flow rate of uh, around 0.6, you can try high flow nasal cannula with awake proning. If the patient does not improve, you or, or you can try a CPAP with a awake proning. And if the patient does not improve with that and is uh, rapidly deteriorating, there are various indices you can calculate. And if you if you have a ROX index of more than 4.88, then you can consider intubation. Uh, I'll not go into the details of the ventilatory strategies because that will be that is a separate cha chapter in itself. And the next topic is going to be discussed uh, on ventilation. Uh, a word of caution: uh, NIV or CPAP can be tried, but they are aerosol generating procedure. So if, if at all you are thinking of trying them, you should take precautions and use uh, maneuvers where aerosol transmission to the healthcare professionals can be uh, limited. Uh, right at the uh, right down corner, you can see a snorkeling mask, which has been a scuba diving mask, which has been modified as an helmet, which can be used to priv uh, uh, to give high flow oxygenation in a COVID patient. This helmet fits the face and would decrease the generation of aerosol and transmission to healthcare workers. For sepsis, if there is a life threatening organ dysfunction and signs of organ failure that, uh, that classifies as sepsis, persisting hypotension in adults is septic shock and in children, any hypotension or a warm vasodilatation with bounding pulse tachypnea would classify as septic shock. There are guidelines by surviving sepsis campaign which have been specifically given for COVID-19 patients. But the major thing which you have to need, uh, which you have to remember is recognize septic shock early, vasopressor to maintain a map of more than 65 and to uh, if there is a lactate of more than two in absence of hypovolemia you think that it is septic shock. Uh, you, need to, uh, you need to be very careful, although the guidelines recommend 30 ml per kg of a fluid bolus in first three hours, but you need to go slow on fluids because if you use large amount of fluid, it can worsen respiratory failure and do not use hypotonic crystalloid starches or gelatins for resuscitation. Vesopressor of choice is norepinephrine or epinephrine. You can also add vesopressin and dopamine in, in patients where the shock is refractory. Most important thing is supportive therapy. DVT prophylaxis should be given in a, every patient. But if you have a D-dimer level of more than 500 nanogram per ml, you should consider changing to the therapeutic dose because there are some studies which have shown that even in patients who do not have DVT, the lung biopsy has shown that there is some evidence of a, a coagulopathy in the lung. So that could also add to worsening respiratory failure and hypoxemia. Give stress sulfur prophylaxis, enteral nutrition should be started as soon as possible and blood transfusion should only be given if the hemoglobin falls to less than 7 grams per deciliter. Steroids are indicated if there is progressive deterioration of oxygenation indicator or there are rapidly worsening or there is persistent shock. You should be careful. Use methylprednisolone 1 to 2 milligram per kg per day and for a shorter period of time, 3 to 5 days because if you use larger dose, it can have immunosuppressive effects and uh, delay the removal of coronavirus. Uh, there are very many other strategies including the immunoglobulins, IL-6 inhibitors, uh, JAK inhibitors, IL-2 inhibitors, but of them the only two things which have shown promising results as, as of now is IL-6 inhibitors that is tocilizumab and then the plasma therapy uh, which uh, is beyond the scope of this, uh, this uh, topic. You have to prevent complications, including the ventilator-associated pneumonia, 
venous embolism, catheter-related blood stream infection, pressure ulcers, and stress ulcer and ICU-related ICU weakness. Cover your mouth and nose and cover your cough and sneeze. These are the important preventive messages which you can circulate amongst your colleagues. And uh, this, is, this is the most important thing. And for droplet precaution, the simple sur surgical mask is more than enough. For contact precaution, PPE is a must. And you should always take aerosol precautions while performing an aerosol generating procedure, which includes a bronchoscopy, intubation, CPR, and uh, at that time you have to wear a full PPE along with N95 or equivalent with a fit tested particular uh, respirator. With that, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, well, many thanks to Professor Balla for such a deep insight into the management of COVID-19 Sadi and septic shock. And we would be breaking up for less than a minute before we go with our next speaker, who is Professor G.D. Puri, and he would be talking about ventilation strategies for management of COVID-19. Uh, meanwhile, I would just request you to post your questions to us. There is a live chat which is going on and you can very well post your questions and we will get back to you with the answers during the question and answer session, which would be at the last. So we will be taking a very short break here. So welcome back uh, and we are back with the second session of the day which is on ventilation strategy and we have with us Professor G.D. Puri who is the Professor and Head of uh, Department of Anesthesia at PGI Chandigarh and also the Dean Academic of PGI and he is accompanied by Professor Raja Rajan, uh, Dr. Raja Rajan rather and uh, he is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Anesthesia. So all over to Professor Puri. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh... Today, COVID is, uh, we are going to talk about the ventilation strategy for the management of COVID. As you know, the 80% of the patients with COVID may not have severe symptoms and may be even managed at uh, uh, healthcare centers or at home. It's only the 20% who are moderate to severe or critically ill. And out of that, only 20% are those who require or are really critically ill. So at the end of the day, if we have 100 patients with the COVID positive, there are only five patients who really require critical care. And we, the, our aim is to avoid a ventilation uh, in these patients, though I'm going to talk about the ventilation strategies. And Dr. Rajarajan is going to talk about, uh, is going to uh, speak on my behalf. And uh, I just want to uh, make one line uh, comment on this that though, Hypoxia is the main biomarker while assessing the progress of patients with COVID and management is to minimize this hypoxemia by whatever method short of ventilation. But if ventilation is required, then though we know that the, 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 the outcome of patients on ventilator varies from mortality of 20 to 80% depending on the uh, facilities. So that is the reason we do our best to minimize the, uh, the chances of these patients going on to ventilation. So with this uh, remarks, I re request Dr. Rajarajan to please carry on. There will be little repetition uh, with the earlier lecture of Dr. Bhalla, who has beautifully covered the management of hypoxemia. We'll try to minimize that reputation and uh, go on to the, uh, the anesthetist or intensivist uh, 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 angle of all these things. Thank you.
Uh, good afternoon everyone so uh, now we'll be uh, discussing on uh, these topics first we'll start with the pathophysiology of uh, the severe acute respiratory infection in covid-19 next we'll talk about the intubation the indication the equipments used and how to do it then we'll talk about the initial ventilator settings troubleshooting on ventilator and finally a short presentation on weaning and extubation so covid-19 can be classified into four categories mild moderate severe and critical when most of the mild patients often recover some of them can proceed to the severe or critical phase and may require icu care conversely some patients can present to the hospital in a severe stage with severe hypoxia requiring intubation and mechanical ventilation to give an idea of the scope of the problem of 710 patients admitted with covid-19 pneumonia in hospital in china 37 of them required mechanical ventilation so what is the pathophysiology of covid-19 it is a new disease so we need to find out how the disease affects the lungs ct scan offers a clue on how the disease is affecting the lung on the left hand side you can see there are ground glass opacities in the lungs so this is the early stage of the disease as the disease progresses the ground glass opacity persists and in addition consolidation also develops as you see on the right side knowledge of this sequence of changes is important when you are going to manage a patient on ventilator ultimately autopsy studies have shown that there is diffuse alveolar damage and it is uh, consistent with ARDS there is emerging evidence suggesting that there are two types of phenotypes in covid-19 in the early stage as seen on the left side the lungs may be compliant and are all well aerated this is phenotype l in later stages the lungs may gain weight become less compliant and become phenotype h which is typical of ARDS in the early stage the ct scan does not show much evidence of lung damage still there is significant occurrence of hypoxia so what is the reason for the hypoxia disproportionate to the imaging findings there have been many proposed reasons one proposed reason is the loss of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction normally when an alveoli receives less oxygen blood flow through the alveoli decreases so that majority of blood goes through the well ventilated alveoli and ultimately the oxygen saturation is maintained when the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is impaired as may be occurring with covid-19 pneumonia it's not yet proven it's just hypothesized what happens here the deoxygenated blood coming from the body goes through the diseased alveoli when it gets diluted along with the oxygenated blood the ultimate saturation decreases as you can see in figure b on the right uh, lower corner the saturation is reduced to 93% a patient presenting as phenotype l may improve or worsen during the course of the disease when he worsens it is probably because of the increased patient respiratory effort and viral damage to the lungs which causes the injury they ultimately end up in h type of lungs with a ards like picture the respiratory features in severe covid-19 include tachypnea rapid increase in worth of breathing and a decline in the oxygenation capacity of the lungs as indicated by a decline in the progressive pf ratio pf ratio is the ratio of partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood to the fraction of oxygen in the inspired gas so as professor balla had mentioned in the previous presentation when a patient develops hypoxemia at the first instance nasal cannula with 6 liters per minute oxygen is provided when we need to increase the fio2 further because of persistent hypoxemia we will need to replace the nasal cannula with a face mask with a reservoir bag this increases the fraction of inspired oxygen if despite the increase in fraction of inspired oxygen the patient's hypoxemia is not improving we proceed to self proning or awake self proning so in awake self proning the patient is asked to lie on his or her stomach so awake proning has shown to alleviate hypoxia in covid-19 patients in our experience when started at the onset of hypoxemia even before we started oxygen therapy it has obviated the need for oxygen supplementation in a few of our patients so how does proning work patients with lung injury have a low vq ratio in the dorsal region of the lungs in covid-19 also it has been shown that the dorsal and basal region of the lungs are more affected when there is low vq ratio there is less ventilation with more perfusion which causes incomplete oxygenation of blood through the lungs and hypoxemia 
when we turn a patient to the prone position the weight of the heart and the dorsum of the lungs is removed this improves the ventilation to the dorsum of the lungs one can argue that by turning the patient prone we also reduce the perfusion from the dorsum to the ventral region however this has not been shown to occur perfusion studies have shown that even when we turn the patient from supine to prone position the blood flow to the prone the dorsal region of the lungs is still maintained the gravity has not been shown to have a significant effect so what ultimately happens in the dorsal and basal regions where there was a low vq ratio causing hypoxemia the ventilation has increased while the perfusion has been maintained this has resulted in better vq matching and improvement in the hypoxemia so there are a few caveats for self awake proning so when we are planning to do a self awake proning we require a cooperative and stable patient if the patient is not able to lie continuously in the prone position he can alternate between different positions sitting left lateral and right lateral positions so changing the position of the patient not only helps in improving the ventilation perfusion matching it also helps in the clearance of secretions non invasive interfaces are generally not used for covid 19 because of the risk of aerosolization however high flow nasal cannula has shown success in some of the centers so the mechanism of action of high flow nasal cannula in previous studies has been proposed to be the occurrence of wash out of dead space and provide, provide provision of a small amount of peep by the increased flow of oxygen still some some people are concerned about the risk of aerosolization another problem with the use of high flow nasal cannula is when the patient load is high the oxygen supply may be inadequate because the high flow nasal cannula requires a supply of 60 liters of oxygen per minute the other niv interface which has been shown to be useful in some centers is helmet niv here the helmet covers the whole face of the niv with the inflatable cuff around the neck this reduces the aerosolization risk again we need to continuously monitor the patient for any deterioration as professor puri had mentioned and professor balla had mentioned we try to avoid intubation as much as possible this is because of a few reasons the first one being that the mortality of the intubation is after intubation is very high this is because the mechanical ventilation may just improve the oxygenation without improving the lung condition secondly many of the patients have been shown to manifest with happy hypoxia what is happy hypoxia the arterial oxygen saturation of the patient may be low but the patient may not feel it they may also have a increased respiratory rate without feeling any discomfort a few possible causes have again been proposed for this which include the neurotropicity of the virus and a compensatory increase in ventilation by the patient what happens in these patients is they do not realize that they are having a decreased oxygenation capacity for a long time and when they exhaust the physiological reserve they have a sudden collapse patients may present to the hospital in a sudden collapse because of this reason the third reason is the sigmoid shape of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve once the arterial partial pressure of oxygen comes to less than 60 mm of mercury it has a steeper decline so when a patient has saturation of 90% we have to be very careful so when we have to do all the mechanisms to avoid the intubation and mechanical ventilation we also need to make sure that there is no delay in intubation this is only possible with a intense and uh, continuous monitoring of the patient the monitoring includes pulse oximetry monitoring we start acting uh, acting on the patient once the saturation uh, comes to up to 95% on room air what can we do we can do proning or we can start drug therapy like tocilizumab if we suspect a cytokine storm we also need to supplement oxygen but this uh, only improves the oxygenation without improving the lung condition the other monitors are respiratory rate monitoring we maintain it to less than 30 to 40 per minute and work of breathing work of breathing is assessed by uh seeing the use of accessory muscles which include the sternocleidomastoid so intubation so the indication for intubation is primarily clinical clinical assessment is necessary especially uh, when a patient develops hypoxemia we try different therapies and then only decide on intubation there are a few possible cut off values like pf ratio sf ratio respiratory rate and increased work of breathing which can guide us in making this decision but these need to be persistent despite the corrective therapy the other indications for intubation include neurological dissociation and cardiac arrest before intubation we need to prepare the ventilator and the circuit for a covid 19 patient these are the things we will require we will require a ventilator a heat uh, moisture exchanging filter attached to the expiratory limb of the ventilator circuit 
a disposable circuit, a capnograph, again one more, one more heat mo uh, moisture exchanging filter at the patient end and a closed suction system. These are attached in the same order. So heat moisture exchange filter not only uh, uh, preserves the heat and uh, uh, humidity, it also filters the viruses. However, when purchasing a uh, HMEF, we need to ensure that it also has a filtration function because there are some HMEs as you can see in the table which do not have any filtration function. The HMEs needs to be changed every 48 hours or whenever it is soiled. The other equipment specific, uh, specifically important for COVID-19 patients is the capnograph. The capnograph consists of a disposable adapter and a sensor connected to the monitor or ventilator. The presence of carbon dioxide waveform ensures correct intubation. It also helps in the ventilation of the patient. When we are using a side stream capnography as in anesthesia machine, we will need to scavenge the gas to avoid the release of filter into the uh, virus into the environment. The other thing important in COVID-19 is closed suction system. The closed suction system consists of a sterile sleeve surrounding the catheter which is attached to the ventilator circuit through a modified T-piece. There is a thumb control for controlling the suction through the vacuum source and there is an irrigation port for saline lavage. This closed suction system maintains the oxygen concentration in the lungs and positive end expiratory pressure during the suctioning. This is especially necessary because it, it is uh, necessary to avoid infection to the healthcare worker by the droplets. So intubation is an aerosol generating procedure. So we need to take some precautions before we proceed for intubation. It is Intubation is preferably done in the intensive care unit with minimum number of personnel in the room. The team and equipment are prepared before starting the procedure to ensure that there is no uh, delay. The intubation is tailored to reduce the release of aerosols into the environment. The most experienced operator does the intubation. A video laryngoscope is preferred as it increases the distance between the patient and the operator. Pre-oxygenation is done with two hand technique to reduce the leak. A rapid sequence induction is done. Before intubation, the tube is clamped and the tube is declamped only after cuff inflation. The ventilator is switched on only after uh, connection to the circuit and the confirmation is uh, done with the capnograph. So the initial ventilator setting in a patient with uh, COVID-19 is shown in this table. At present, there is no mode of ventilation which has been shown to be superior to another. So we can use volume control, pressure control or any other similar mode. We target an oxygen saturation of 90 to 94 percent in a ventilated patient. Respiratory rate initially it is set at around 20 per minute and it is titrated to a pH of more than 7.2. The tidal volume, plateau pressure, positive end expiratory pressure and recruitment maneuvers are done based on the compliance as we had seen before the phenotype L or phenotype H. The driving pressure is kept at less than 15 centimeter of water. Sedation is done with clinical monitoring and paralysis done only when it is required along with neuromuscular monitoring. So what is compliance? This graph shows a pressure time scalar with pressure on the y axis and time on the x axis. In volume control ventilation, we provide an inspiratory pass at the end of the breath during which there is no air going in or out of the lung. The pressure at this point is the plateau pressure. So compliance is the uh, Compliance values obtained by the tidal volume delivered divided by the difference between the plateau pressure and positive end expiratory pressure. In type L, there is low elastance and high compliance. In type phenotype H, there is high elastance and low compliance. A cutoff value of 40 ml per centimeter of water has been uh, proposed to differentiate between the two phenotypes. How much tidal volume should we keep? First, we calculated, calculate the predicted body weight of the patient. For a 165 uh, centimeter male, it is around 60 kilograms. So in type L, phenotype L, there is high compliance. There, we give a tidal volume of 8 ml per kg of predicted body weight. If we, uh, It has been noted that when these patients receive lesser tidal volumes, there is volume starvation. Volume starvation is uh, observed by a buckling of the pressure time scalar and the volume control ventilation. In type phenotype H, there is low compliance of the lungs, less than 40 ml per centimeter of water and in these patients, 6 ml per kg predicted body weight or even lesser may be needed according to the driving pressure. So what is driving pressure? Driving pressure is the difference between plateau pressure and positive end expiratory pressure. It indicates the lung strain. When in a diseased lung, all the alveoli are not equally uh, diseased and there may be some 
healthy alveoli. The driving pressure is the pressure which is used to distend the healthy alveoli and uh, we need to maintain a driving pressure of less than 15 centimeter of water to prevent over distension of the healthy alveoli. So what is the strategy for positive indexpiratory pressure and plateau pressure? It is recommended to keep the maximum positive indexpiratory pressure to 8 centimeter of water in phenotype L and the plateau pressure to less than 20 centimeter of water. In phenotype H where there is high elastance and low compliance, we can go for higher amounts of positive indexpiratory pressure provided the plateau pressure is less than 30 centimeter of water. If all these measures do not work, then we need to go for proning, uh, proning the ventilated patient. It is a resource intensive procedure and it is, it is uh, done preferably early in the course of mechanical ventilation within the first 48 hours. And when it is done, it should be maintained for at least 16 hours daily. Some of the complications of this include uh, tube displacement and increased intra-abdominal pressure occurrence of a pressure source. As we had seen before, one of the possible causes for uh, hypoxemia in the COVID-19 patient is the loss of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So inhaled nitric oxide which is delivered through the ventilator circuit may be beneficial to these patients by improving the VQ matching. The final resort would be to provide rest to the lungs and provide oxygen to the body by use of an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Both of these are expensive modalities. When a patient uh, of COVID-19 is on ventilator, we often cannot use the stethoscope. In such a case, we need to be aware of the ventilator graphics to troubleshoot. When it is the peak, ins when the peak inspiratory pressure is high, we need to see if the plateau pressure is high or normal. A high peak inspiratory pressure with a normal plateau pressure denotes a decrease in compliance while a high inspiratory pressure, uh, sorry, while a high inspiratory pressure with an increased plateau pressure denotes a decrease in compliance while high inspiratory pressure with a normal plateau pressure denotes an increase in resistance. Also, we do not routinely nebulize these patients and these things become of, uh, of special value. So, when a patient of COVID-19 is on ventilator, we need to have uh, protocols for circuit disconnections. They can be deliberate either for change of the circuit or HMEs or they can occur accidentally. When such a thing is planned or it happens accidentally, we need to uh, administer additional paralysis to the patient and ensure that the work gets done in a rapid manner. When a patient undergoes a cardiac arrest, we need to have mechanical compression devices because sweating during mechanical compression can breach the personal protective equipment. Since the uh, virus has no curative agent right now, it has a prolonged disease course and early weaning is avoided in these patients. When we, when we plan to extubate these patients, we do with the same uh, aerosol generating procedure precautions that we did with intubation. In addition, we need to do a leak test before extubation. When the patients have turned COVID-19 uh, negative on uh, microbiological examination, we can proceed for non-invasive ventilation to bridge over the uh, post extubation period. These patients are then later transferred to the non-critical area when they are clinically stable. A few of the parameters include the saturation, the respiratory rate, requirement of vasopressors and clinical stability. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you Dr. Rajarajan and Professor Puri for this presentation and I would request you all to keep posting your questions on the live chat which is going on and we would be back in less than a minute with the next speaker of the day, Professor Nusrat Shafiq, who is a uh, professor in the Department of Pharmacology at PGI and she would be talking about chemoprophylaxis and pharmacologic considerations during COVID-19. So we will be back in less than a minute.
Uh, so welcome back and uh, we have our next speaker of the day, Professor Nusrat Shafi, who is a professor in pharmacology at PGI Chandigarh and she would be talking about chemo prophylaxis and pharmacologic consideration during COVID-19. All over to Professor Shafi. Thank you, Dr. Arpit. Uh, a very good afternoon to all of you. I am joined here with uh, Dr. Praveen Kumar. He's senior resident in my department. And uh, he's the person who's running the chemo profile axis. And we'll have some things coming from his mouth as well. So at the outset, I would like to mention one thing that the presentation today is not about the potential agents which are being evaluated for their efficacy in the management of COVID-19 patients. We are just going to talk about chemo prophylaxis and then we'll also look into some of the pharmacological considerations associated with the drugs that are used for management of comorbidities. Uh, before, at the outset, we must uh, inquire whether COVID-19 makes a good case for chemo prophylaxis. As is the general principle of uh, chemo prophylaxis, we have three important tenets. The disease should be severe and we have, we have to have specific risk groups which can be identified and the agent or agents that we are taking into consideration should be safe, effective and affordable prophylactic agent. Um, we will examine each one of these one by one. COVID-19 in certain subgroup of patients can definitely get severe. We do have a specific high risk group, which is patients' contacts. They can be and all they can be healthcare workers or uh, an next of kin of the patients. So they do make a high risk group as in contagiousness is concerned. And uh, uh, as regards to safe, effective and affordable prophylactic agent, we will see if that is actually the case. Uh, before uh, uh, we could uh, examine it in, uh, on scientific uh, methods, we had a lot of uh, news items which were coming on, uh, which were coming in from different sources which uh, in fact we which kind of eulogize the drugs in question. Need I say the drugs that we're talking about are hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Uh, there were statements like it is the game changer drug or there was a beeline for uh, countries asking for uh, hydroxychloroquine supplies to be reinitiated. So, uh, so it was all over the news. There were some preceding events which led to this kind of thing. But uh, uh, important thing is to realize that hydroxychloroquine, which was, uh, which has a rather difficult uh, name, I mean, it is difficult to pronounce. Uh, it's come, become a very commonly used name. People are using it very commonly. And so much so that uh, people were calling up uh, our centers, our colleagues to ask if they could take the medicine for prophylaxis. Let me tell you, these drugs, hydroxychloroquine, which is a kind of congener of chloroquine, these two drugs are used for malaria, both as prophylactic agent and as treatment agents. They also find use in rheumatological illness, various rheumatological illnesses such as rheumatoid arthritis and SLE, to name a few. So uh, this is how the, it was uh, reported in the media and how it was uh, interpreted by the lay people. But let's uh, take a closer scientific look. Uh, what is the available evidence? That is the general way we go about uh, making our decisions regarding any kind of uh, therapeutic or prophylactic agent. Uh, the work on uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine started quite many decades ago and uh, in vitro studies, experimental studies did show some kind of virological response uh, with the, uh, both with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and even a mechanism of action or should I say several mechanisms of actions were attributed to kind of virological response that was uh, uh, antiviral action that was seen with these uh, drugs. Some of them would be like increasing endosomal pH in host intracellular organelles, uh, inactivating enzymes that virus require for replication and uh, inhibiting the uh, 
uh, interaction between the virus and the receptor for the virus that is your angiotensin converting enzyme too. So those were kind of mechanisms which were also attributed to the antiviral response that was seen. But was that enough? If we just go back into the history of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, we understand that uh, it is nothing like it is not a new kid on the block. I mean, in 1960 itself, it was uh, the first report of uh, management of a severe infectious mononucleosis with chloroquine was uh, came out. And subsequently, it was evaluated in myriad of viral illnesses, I mean, things as diverse as HIV to dengue and influenza. It is important to note that though all along in vitro evidence is there, but the clinical evidence has rather been inconsistent. And in fact, in certain situations, it may be paradoxical effects have also been seen as in exacerbation of disease or not even having any clinical benefit. And one important thing here would be, I would say, um, it's a, uh, um, lack of efficacy which was shown in influenza prevention. So uh, with this background, we see what is the current evidence, current clinical evidence for therapeutics for hydroxychloroquine and uh, chloroquine. Uh, we all heard about this interesting uh, report which was uh, all over the places in um, media, in the scientific literature. This was a study done by a group of French um, physicians, Gautret et al. And uh, they showed that at day six there was a uh, remarkable improvement in the number of patients who became virus, um, uh, who became free of virus with at, uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin or hydroxychloroquine alone as compared to those who, who received no drugs. So that was very sensationally reported, but if you look at, uh, if you take a closer look at the evidence which was uh, presented for uh, the scientific community, it was noticed that there were a lot of flaws and unanswered question. And short in the ease of this report came another paper which was again from France. It appeared in French uh, um, and uh, perhaps uh, was not as widely read also. This was a report which came as a letter to editor and it followed the same protocols and the findings were rather to the contrary. A similar kind of contrary report has recently appeared. This was West Veterans Affairs um, studies and there again in a uh, cohort of 368 uh, patients, it was seen that uh, in fact it could have possibly led to in, uh, increase in ventilatory requirement. So suffice it to say that at the moment for therapy itself, the data about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine being useful is rather rudimentary. It is inconsistent and quality of studies is circumspect. One can now take it with a pinch of salt because um, in the current situations the, the quality does get compromised but the real answers have to come from properly conducted randomized control trials and if we just take a look through clinicaltrials.gov we have nearly 100 studies which are being undertaken for or have been undertaken for hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine in this subgroup of patients but there is only one the one that you see on the top here is the one which is um, the one which is addressing prophylaxis uh, in particular. This is uh, the trial's name is Crown Corona trial and um, here in different doses of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are being evaluated as against placebo for assessing the prophylactic benefit of these agents. So this study has just been initiated. It is being conducted in several centers across the, con uh, across the globe. But um, we still do not have the results, even the interim analysis. It has just seen, started recently. Having said that, uh, the other aspect we move on to, the safety issues. So we said in the beginning that any agent should, be, uh, should have an evidence of efficacy and should also um, uh, come fully on the, um, the safety issues as well. So it is, these agents are not bereft of say, uh, harmful effect. We do have innocuous kind of uh, harmful effects like headache, loss of appetite, nausea. 
innocuous they may they are very common but and sometimes they even can get severe for example for one of our patients we have uh, uh, sorry healthcare workers we had severe nausea weight loss hypoglycemia blurred vision retinopathy though it occurs usually with a longer duration of uh, administration remains a concern uh, very importantly disturbances in ecg are quite uh, are uh, uh, can uh, lead to uh, situations where we need to uh, stop uh, the drug urgently and uh, sometimes we may not even uh, decide we may need to decide against giving hydroxychloroquine even if for prophylaxis so at this point we would like to say that uh, qt prolongation should not be considered as synonymous with development of tos ad point because uh, um, but it is got if it is considered as one of the important risks for development of the rhythm disturbance that i was talking about i just mentioned tos ads and uh, it definitely is a concern both with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine um the indian heart rhythm society has come up with an algorithm wherein they have said that uh, before initiating hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine prophylaxis one must do ecg and uh, determine the qt interval and uh, uh, they have given uh, they have advocated that if it is more than 500 millisecond a decision may be taken for not administering um, uh, hydroxychloroquine or uh, chloroquine Uh, or it should be very very closely monitored and if a repeat ecg shows an increase in 60 milliseconds then um, it should definitely be stopped uh, it is very important to understand that uh, uh, there are certain risk factors which are uh, known uh, for qt prolongation and a person must be evaluated for the presence of these risk factors uh, some of these are structural heart disease especially ventricular hypertrophy which may be common in the age group of healthcare workers that we would be uh, administering our um, uh, drug to and uh, if there is a previous history of ventricular arrhythmia or syncope history of implantable heart rhythm devices and more very importantly drug interactions Uh, should be ruled out some of the important drug interactions would be those with macrolides and we all know that azithromycin is being given in several, several centers as a concomitant medication azithromycin itself can lead to qt prolongation and the two together can definitely lead to a longer qt prolongation quinolones antihistaminics then lopinavir ritonavir itself can also lead to qt prolongation and then the list is long so it is advisable that anybody who is administering uh, hcq as a prophylactic agent must rule out uh, the potential drug interactions uh, we have uh, american college of cardiology's uh, tisdale score of qt prolongation risk provided by indian heart rhythm society uh, does well for our kind of setups uh at this point i would like to bring in why we are this the uh, bring in the question about uh, why we are administering hcq prophylaxis if there is uh, uh, mm, there is a question or it is uh, circumspect about the efficacy is doubtful for prophylaxis one important reason is that after examining the evidence early during the course of the pandemic Uh, icmr came up with an advisory wherein they had uh, recommended for two groups of individuals those who are asymptomatic healthcare workers and involved in the care of suspected or confirmed cases of covid-19 and the second is asymptomatic household contacts of lab confirmed cases for these two group of individuals they had said they advise hcq prophylaxis at the end of the advisory they it was very clearly written that it should not be given without the prescription uh, with a of a doctor and secondly it said that children less than 15 years of age should not be administered uh, subsequently because it was uh, the way it was uh, shown in the media a lot of people indulged in self administration health ministry of health and family welfare came up with uh, a guidance which is there on their website and it was an important message that they uh, propagated regarding 
um, uh, advising people not to self-administer HCQ for prophylaxis. It said that it is a prescription medicine and its sale is totally prohibited without a valid prescription by a doctor. Fortunately, now this aspect is being uh, followed um, and we would uh, suggest that anybody who wishes to take uh, this as a prophylaxis uh, should get himself or herself evaluated by a qualified practitioner for eligibility and for ruling out contraindications. Uh, what is the dose is an important thing that is we are often asked. ICMR recommended 400 milligram BD stat dose followed by 400 milligram at weekly intervals for seven weeks for healthcare workers and three weeks for other population. But let me make it very clear there are different doses which have been evaluated. Uh, an interesting case in um, a systematic review in this context is that by Cotigiani et al. And if you see all kinds of doses have been given and uh, uh, we still do not have an answer for uh, the correct doses that should be used. And uh, the Crown Corona trial that I had mentioned earlier is evaluating three possible doses and they narrow down to these three doses based on the literature search and the uh, information derived from uh, various um, in vitro studies and ph physiological based pharmacokinetic modeling. So they are evaluating but till now we really do not know which would be the best dose for prophylaxis. Now I would like to Praveen to uh, Praveen Kumar here, he's senior resident here in our department to take you through the process that we have adopted for healthcare workers for administering this uh, HCQ profile access at PGI Chandigarh. So over to you Praveen, okay. I'll manage this for you. Okay. Good afternoon to all. Uh, so uh, many would be first of all asking, why do we need a proper screening for healthcare worker? Because healthcare worker is already a healthcare worker. But what you should understand is healthcare worker constitutes a different strata, right? From faculties to uh, nursing officials, doctors, and also even sanitary workers. So it is important for them that they understand what they are getting administered with. This will help them making their own decision and it will also help them in not taking unnecessary over um, what is that overconfidence that the drug is going to work and adopt other safety measures which they should have adopted. So as such, as soon as the healthcare worker comes, we give them what is the real fact, whatever ma'am has said, we I generally narrate it in their language which will, they'll be comfortable with. If there is a faculty, I generally talk it in a more scientific way, like going into the mechanism of action, make them understand what, why the drug is going to act, why the drug is the efficacy, why the drug, uh, the kind of evidence is available is very less. If it is a healthcare worker who might not understand English, we generally convey in Hindi, in their, I, we try to tell them all the facts and then we let them themselves decide whether they need to take it or not after they have decided they need to take it is very very important that the contraindications of them being screened the ma'am will be listing down on those contraindications which we have in fact some of the contraindication though we have until now screened around 200 individuals some of the contraindication are really complete contraindication though it might be have been identified in one or two those are very important to be identified and stopped at this level because if you see the risk benefit ratio since the benefit of this drug is not very well known a uh, high level risk cannot be taken so after the patient has uh, uh, been screened then what do we do is we let them know their schedule in the mail or if they don't have the mail id we let them know the schedule in their whatsapp why this is important because in their frantic duty and in between all the fear looming uh, they it is very much possible that they, they forget when did they take the initial dose at so generally they might take to work or not so we document it and we immediately send on the next day or the same day in their mail id or the whatsapp regarding their complete schedule what one more important information we uh, take about is their first day of exposure 
exposure to whether they have got exposed to a covid 19 patient or not suppose for example a person is taking a hcq profile axis and he is turning out to be positive in the future we might wrongly ascribe it that hcq is not working but his exposure would have been some 20 days before itself so once this kind of screening process is undertaken we exactly get to know when the patient has started hcq also we exactly get to know when their uh, first exposure is there so after this we follow for the adverse events and we document the adverse event at each visit and the most important thing is uh, this might actually look a bit uh, bit how we are going how we are doing but we are actually doing it is that we administer each and every week dose as dots therapy so the patient the patient comes we the participant comes we give the dose we ask for the adverse event we give back this is again a very beautiful setup why because see the evidence is emerging suppose for example if the icmr in the future uh, tell that you need to stop it stop the dispensation of the drug we will be able to stop exactly on that same day throughout the healthcare throughout our entire pga why because we know each and every person who is taking hcq how many doses he have taken and uh, what where he is located and other thing and this dots therapy also helps us dispensing in uh, in the places where they get quarantined generally they get quarantined in multiple places we have a time where we go to their quarantine places and deliver to them so that's all for me i now uh, give back the mic to man so thank you praveen and uh, we have outlined the flow that we use for uh, uh, administering hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis here and we have uh, i would like to add that the area where ecg is done is exclusive for ex uh, exclusively for these healthcare workers and uh, um, the other thing that is important is that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, sent messages that they should, if they wish to start, that they should be starting it prior to their uh, anticipated uh, COVID ward duty. Um, so uh, the important other aspect of HCQ was that since it is given for other conditions, we started getting a lot of queries about uh, the safety and whether they should be continuing with their HCQ. So we sent a very a, a consistent message through various portals that if HCQ has been advised previously by your doctor for your medical condition, then please continue as before because you would have been evaluated for these conditions and uh, you would have the doctor would have felt that it is needed and it is reasonably safe within those uh, within the mm, limitations of that need so please do not discontinue your medication if you are already on hcq for any other condition uh, the other uh, moving from HCQ chemo prophylaxis, I'll just take a quickly uh, quick look at the other issues related to drug. An important query is which antipyretic to take. In initially, there was some confusion about NSAIDs having some kind of detrimental outcome in COVID-19 patients. So let me clarify. This thing was clarified subsequently. And best guidelines that I could come across for this aspect was NICE guideline, which was later, its latest version says that either paracetamol or ibuprofen or for that matter any other NSAID may be used. But uh, we would say recommend that uh, paracetamol would be, considering its safety profile, would be the best agent uh, to go ahead with. But uh, there is no negative statement regarding NSAID. It is important to understand that antipyretics should be used uh, only when it becomes tr troublesome. They should not be used for the sole aim of reducing body temperature. The uh, uh, recommendation has come from, uh, uh, from the evidence which is drawn from fever associated with other influenza like illnesses. The ACE inhibitors and ARB quagmire, it was uh, quite uh, widely touted as and then subsequently we started receiving queries from our hypertensive patients and our diabetics whether we, they should they need to continue their ACE inhibitors or ARBs, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, so uh, let me make it very clear now the statements from various organizations are very clear about uh, this aspect what they say is 
that if any hypertensive or um, patient or any patient with cardiovascular disease or a diabetic is receiving these agents, they need to just continue on these agents as they were doing before. Uh, some people are also investigating uh, these agents for management of COVID-19 uh, uh, patient for management of COVID-19 patients. But the guidelines say that outside trial settings, these should not be used for management of uh, COVID-19 patients. Corticosteroids have been uh, controversial. Uh, there are two aspects of the controversy. One is about the usefulness for management of patients. And uh, some uh, preliminary studies have indicated that these may not be useful in COVID-19 patients. We have different agencies which have given their recommendation for use of COVID-19, uh, for use of corticosteroids for these patients. So NIH guidelines are more or less very clear. Uh, they say that for mechanically ventilated patients with ARDS, there is insufficient evidence either for or against corticosteroids. However, for adults with COVID-19 and refractory shock, low-dose corticosteroid therapy, that is for shock reversal, um, has uh, some evidence and may be decided on a case-to-case -case basis. Now we come to the second aspect. The second aspect is about patients who are on chronic corticosteroids for various other illness. The, state, the recommendations are very clear. They should not be discontinued. On a case-to-case -case basis, supplemental or st stress dose steroids may be indicated. Inhaled corticosteroids should not be discontinued in patients with COVID-19 if these patients were already on inhaled corticosteroids, for example, for asthma. For pregnant women who are facing a situation of preterm labor, what uh, the guidelines say is that before 34 weeks of gestation, who those pregnant women who are at risk of pregnant preterm birth, uh, corticosteroids may be given. But after 34 weeks of gestation, those who are at, uh, that is your late preterm risk, it is said that it, uh, corticosteroids may be avoided, need to be avoided. But again, there is a scope of individualization there. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to come to an end of my talk by saying that it is very important that uh, uh, we, um, we ensure scientific integrity and public confidence in this time of crisis because we may have some vaccines which may be coming up uh, later and we would not want to lose the confidence of public in this uh, uh, regard. So some level of scientific integrity in our recommendations should be maintained, keeping in mind that evidence is evolving. It is evolving fast. So both these things are important. With this, I would like to say thank you to all for a patient listening. And if there are any questions and comments, I would be happy to take. Thank you. Oh, well, many thanks to Professor Nusrat for uh, such a deep insight into hydroxychloroquine and other pharmacology uh, considerations. And uh, we would uh, like to hold on for a moment. And we will be back with a question and answer session. And meanwhile, I just would like to give you a final chance to post your questions to us on the live chat. So we will be back in less than a minute.
So welcome back and uh, we had a wonderful session today and we are back with our panelists, an eminent panel of uh, speakers here. So for the first question, uh, it is about, uh, uh, there had been a lot of uh, discussion on uh, sharing of ventilators. So what is, what is the PGI take on, uh, on this? So initially when the pandemic started, uh, some places had a lot of deficiency in ventilator and there was anticipation that there would be a lot of requirements. So they started sharing ventilators using splitters, most of which were uh, uh, 3D printed. But uh, there need to be specific uh, uh, indications when you have to share a ventilator. For example, the lungs must be similar. When you are ventilating two patients on one ventilator, you need to have similar types of lungs. But now the American Society of uh, Anesthesiology has come out with clear recommendations against the sharing of ventilation. Yeah, one of the question was uh, what happens to the infection. Since all the patients are uh, COVID-19 infected, the ch chance of cross infection by the virus reduces, but the chances of infection by the bacteria still remains. But the HME may protect to uh, heat moisture exchanger with filter may protect to some amount against this uh, occurrence, but still it's uh, not recommended. Also, what will happen when one of the patient decompensates? How to disconnect that patient? How to cut off the ventilator supply to that patient? What will what may what can happen is the other patient's lung can get damaged during that period. And so right now the onus has been on improving the number of ventilators rather than starting to share the ventilators. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Raja Rajan and uh, uh, Professor Nusrat. I mean, there is a question, although we were expecting quite a lot and we had received a lot of question on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I mean, you had really explained it in detail, uh, what is hydroxychloroquine and what is its mechanism and what is the literature available. But still, there is uh, some confusion over there. Uh, some people are really considering hydroxychloroquine as a vaccine and they are uh, advocating, uh, you know, uh, a utilization of hydroxychloroquine on a community level for everybody. So we just want you to clarify it in a uh, in bit of detail uh, so that this misconception is put to rest. Uh, so thank you Artit. Uh, uh, let me make it very reiterate the point which uh, if you have seen that Ministry of Health and Family Welfare message that was in the form of poster it was very clearly written that it is a prescription drug and it is not to be administered by one's own self. And uh, uh, any lay person uh, or for that matter any qualified person also taking it without doctor's prescription is an absolute no-no. And uh, a set of contraindications have to be ruled out by the prescriber also uh, before they administer. So some of those uh, contraindications we had enumerated in our talk. The other would be things like a known hypersensitivity to the agent. If there is a, a granulocytosis also, then there could be an issue. If a person is one-eyed, for example, then we would be circumspect about giving this patient uh, or any uh, this uh, person um, hydroxychloroquine and uh, things like G6PD, which is very important. Uh, if is if there is a case who, who of or if there a person is a known case of G6PD deficiency, then we do not administer hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. It is important to know that in current circumstances, it may be rather difficult to carry out evaluation for G6PD, but a verbal history should be taken, it should be taken, uh, a history should be taken and it must be inquired for at least those who have a known history then this should not be administered. And to consider it as a kind of vaccine would be a big mistake. Uh, we should have, uh, uh, we uh, should in say maybe a month's time or something, we should have some preliminary data about its efficacy as a prophylactic agent for the group of uh, subjects that have been advocated, uh, had been advised this kind of prophylaxis, but uh, oh, certainly not as a vaccine. Yeah, I must like, uh, I would again uh, like to reiterate this, just to avoid the misuse, even amongst the healthcare workers, we adopted this strategy that we will give you the drug only when you come to us. You know, uh, we'll give you one tablet at one time because earlier what was happening was you prescribe the drug, you give them 10 tablets, you ask them to take it at home every weekly one dose, 
what will happen is they will they will probably distribute it to their family to their friends and then come back again to you that we've run out of it right so we kind of and if there is someone who's taking it in the community and is not being monitored uh, what i wanted to reiterate what nusrat said g6pd in north india northwestern india is very common very common and we've seen patients who develop uh, you know iv hemolysis following very commonly used drugs dapsone is one of them chloroquine is one of them so uh, you know it can cause more damage somebody uh, put it very nicely that the main dictum of practicing medicine is first do no harm so if the you know since the benefit is doubtful our aim should be to make whatever we are giving at least safer and if we can't make it any safer then at least do a monitoring so my advice to everyone is please do not self prescribe hcq only take it under a prescription from a doctor and follow up with the doctor because it can cause fatal arrhythmias and other fatal complications so be very careful uh, well so the take home message is uh, quite clear out from here that uh, hcq on self prescription can be uh, fatal as well so uh, taking a little ahead uh, professor bhalla uh, asymptomatic cases you know there is a lot of hue and cry about uh, this nowadays so is there some ways and measures as a healthcare professional you know to identify them a bit early or to do something uh, to prevent cross contamination uh, okay so uh, I, i have two different kind of uh, view points on this first is the ministry said that 80% of the uh, cases would have no or mild symptoms this is how it was printed in the paper it has to be printed the other way around 80% of the cases would have mild symptom some of them would have no symptoms that is what it should be uh, if we do not test the entire population we will not know how many of them are asymptomatic roaming around us they can transmit infections that is one point but let me ask you another question in an healthy individual how would you develop a herd immunity you will develop a herd immunity only if these asymptomatic cases will increase in number you know you have the infection but you don't have the disease that is what is herd immunity so if these asymptomatic patients are roaming around in the community i understand it is bad for people who are at high risk people who are obese people who are diabetics people who are hypertensive chronic uh, illnesses they can die but they are like chalta phirta vaccine they are vaccinating everyone else around and increasing the herd immunity so you can have a look at this from both the point point of views yes they are dangerous for people who are at high risk so keep your elderly keep your high risk away from strangers away from your own self the healthy individuals because the healthy individuals the youngsters if they do not if they do not develop this asymptomatic infection we will never develop a herd immunity and if we do not develop a herd immunity this lockdown i don't know how long we can continue it so th- this lockdown is giving us time to build up our healthcare resources and also to learn a lesson that we need to keep the high risk individuals at home we need to keep our our parents our grandparents at home stay away from them so that we do not pass this infection to them if it passes amongst ourselves those of us who are healthy it is good for us probably we will be able to build a herd, herd immunity so look at it from that point of view uh, well uh, thank you professor bala we are indeed overwhelmed with uh, this kind of an insight into herd immun- immunity uh, taking up the second last question for the day it is about uh, bcg vaccination although in india we almost all of us are vaccinated but many countries uh, especially the european ones are taking the bcg vaccination nowadays so from academic point of view uh, how good is it i mean 
See, there are, uh, there are uh, I think Nusrat will probably uh, try to explain it more. The only difference between European countries, the Americas and uh, India is that we have universal BCG vaccination at birth and we have a lot of load of TB. So a lot of us would be having a latent TB, maybe having some kind of an immunity with that already existing in our body. So that may be one of the reasons coupled with another reason that we are a younger nation. We have only 6% people who are above 60 or 65 years of age. So these two reasons combined together probably and the lockdown probably are the reasons why we have not seen a su sudden upsurge, right? Uh, we are, and Nusrat is with me as a co-investigator in this trial, which we are trying to take up with a recombinant BCG vaccine and we look at it in a more scientific manner because even with BCG, we know that the immunity wanes over a period of time. So making some of us more vulnerable. So we are trying to use uh, recombinant BCG vaccine and study whether uh, what is its immunogenicity and what is its immunological effect and would it be able to prevent the coronavirus infection in, uh, in, in uh, adults. Yes, sir. I would like to just uh, add on to your point by saying that, uh, yes, it's a theory which needs to be confirmed and the best way to confirm it is carry out in our city. And uh, fortunately for us, we have a good capacity in uh, vaccine manufacturing in our country and uh, this project has been uh, taken up for, and let's see what uh, the results show us. Fine. That's all I think. Yeah, it needs to be investigated. Well, thank you, Professor Nusrat. And we are already shooting up the time. Uh, before we say goodbye, there is one last question I want to ask. Uh, it is about the pediatric patients, where we generally aim at uh, oxygen SpO2 of around 93 or even more. Yes. So, in COVID pediatric patients, or let's say in COVID patients, uh, what are the guidelines? I mean, what do we aim at and why so? So, uh, as we had seen the oxygen uh, hemoglobin dissociation curve, so it becomes a steep slope below a, a partial pressure of oxygen of 60 millimeter of mercury, which corresponds to a saturation of uh, 90%. So, that's uh, one main reason why we target a saturation of uh, 90% in adult COVID-19 uh, patients. So, when we come to pediatric patients, there are a few more considerations. So there have been a studies which show that a saturation of at least 93% is required when there is uh, injury to the end organs. So that is one of the reason why we need to maintain a higher saturation in pediatric patients. The other reason being the pulse oximetry which is used to monitor the saturation, it is not 100% accurate. So we give some margin to make sure that adequate oxygenation, uh, oxygen is delivered to the tissues of the pediatric patient. Well, thank you Dr. Rajarajan and with this we have come to an end of today's webinar. We had an overwhelming session, an uh, in-depth discussion on various aspects of management of COVID-19. And with this, I want to thank the panelists for the day, Professor Nusrat Shafi from Department of Pharmacology, Professor Ashish Balla from the Department of Internal Medicine and Dr. Rajarajan and Professor G.D. Puri from the Department of Anesthesia. And I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome you for the next webinar session, which is on nursing care of the patients with COVID-19. This session is scheduled on 28th of April at 12 noon. And again, there will be a session on mental health issues in COVID-19 on 1st of May at 12 noon. And before I leave, I would like to flash uh, the PGI helpline number, which is 01722755. So this helpline can be very well utilized and you can give, you can ask your queries with our helpline team and they will also help directing you or connecting you to the relevant experts in PGI. And I also would like to thank each one of you for connecting with us. Thank you so much. Jenny.